Uh, how many people here are actually leading a team today? Uh, or just raise your hand if you're a team leader today. Or just type in the chat, team lead or TL or something like that. I don't know what O slash means, but I guess that's half and half. <laughs> okay, a few good people. Um, okay, how many people here are soon to be at some point will lead a team? Uh, oh, OL is hand up. I didn't realize. Oh, that's cool. That's I didn't realize that. That's I learned something today, and it was worth it. So if you're going to lead a team, say FTL, future team lead. Okay. And if you're an architect, just say A. Let's see what happens. Okay, cool. Um, well, hopefully this talk is going to be um, relevant to everyone here. Um, and, and I just want to mention that this talk is, uh, is based on a lot of, um, you know, mistakes that I've personally made, <laughs> that I've seen other people do, and also some successes that I've had uh, leading people and, I've, and watching some of the most successful uh, people that have either led me or in other companies and, and seeing how they worked. Um, okay, let's, let's just begin. So, so a little bit about me. Uh, I wrote a book called Art of Unit Testing, um, and, and it was really great to, to, to write a book about unit testing because I thought, well, let me just, um, how would I define a team lead? We'll talk about that. That's exactly what we're going to talk about in this 35 minutes. Um, so I wrote a book called Art of Unit Testing, and I thought, well, that would solve the entire problem because every time people would want to adopt unit testing, I'll just give them the book, and then everything will be solved. And I was just doing courses and trainings, etc., and it was great. But every time I came to a company, back to a company, I would, um, they would say, well, the course was great, but they would be in the same state they were when I just started uh, teaching them. So people were not advancing. They wanted to change, but they were not able to, to actually make changes into the culture of the company or, or to the way things were working, into the processes. So there, something was missing. There was like glue that was missing in actually making things uh, um, change. So I wrote a book called Elastic Leadership, which deals basically with these things. How do you actually change the culture? How do you lead people uh, to change their behavior at work? How do you, how do you um, change the processes? Uh, what, does, what, what is the difference between having your own thought of what you want to happen and actually getting other people to actually change their mind as well? That's what that book is about. And a lot of this talk is going to be based on that. So we're going to talk about what is a leader, what is the role of a leader. Um, we're, talking, we're going to talk about growing teams. Um, how do you grow a team? Um, what are the um, most successful ways that I found in, in actually growing a team? How do you challenge people? How does learning actually work? Now I'm going to talk about survival mode, which is one of the um, phases that I talk about in the book, uh, because that's one of the main things that prevent us from actually growing our teams today is being in survival mode and uh, that's kind of i'll put this whole into like a the elastic leadership framework so we can we can talk about that work fits and throughout if people have questions i'm going to say well does anybody have any questions and then uh, feel free to ask them so i just want to start by you know saying the most uh, th the thing that a lot of people realize at the end of many conferences and unfortunately it's very likely that this talk will not make any difference in your professional life. I mean, it's very sad to say, but you know, you go to conferences or you attend conferences online and then, you know, and you listen to all these great things and all this great stuff and you say, oh, this is cool, I wanna give it a try. And then you go and you actually start working in your company and then everything comes back to normal. Everything goes back to the way it was. So actually changing things from what you actually have in your head to actually making things different at work um, can sometimes seem almost impossible. And um, this is a lot, you know, of what I came, um, came through when I became a team leader. How do you actually change people's behaviors? And to do that, the first question I wanna ask is, are you a leader? So I asked at the beginning, how many people here are, are leaders, right? And how, people, how many people here are future team leaders? How many people here are architects? Um, here's a different way to ask the same question. Um, if you want to know if you're a leader, and even if you're not an official leader today, um, ask yourself this question instead. Are you a potential bottleneck? Are you a bottleneck in your team today? 
So what is a bottleneck? A bottleneck is a someone that has the ability to do something that other people can't um, or that has permission to do something that other people don't have permission to. Uh, someone that can answer questions that other people cannot answer. Um, the simplest example of a bottleneck could be the only person in the team that knows how the build works. So when the build fails, that's the only that, uh, that knows why it failed. Or the only person on the team that has permission to run or to do the deployment. Or the only person who knows how the architecture works. Or the only person who knows how to make a decision of the architecture or to review code or anything like that. And in the way we should think about our delivery process is that it's made out of bottlenecks. It's made out of basically a chain of dependencies where people basically act as bottlenecks. And uh, one of the main characters of, uh, of leaders today is their ability to, to use the fact that they're a bottleneck and use it for good, right? So a lot of people use their ability to be a bottleneck for... Well, I wouldn't say nefarious reasons, right? But definitely for job security. I've seen people use it for job security. Have you ever had that, you know, that person at work that um, doesn't like to share how some information is done or doesn't like to share their code and how things are supposed to work or doesn't like to answer, just, like, just let me work alone and leave me in peace. Um, and then that person becomes very, very valuable to the company because the information in their head becomes almost impossible to replace or when something is missing, that person is the only person who can fix it. So that's an example of using it not for good. Um, but we can use the same definition of, um, of, uh, of bottleneck to say, well, what if I chose to use my ability to be like the single source where everything in that specific subject comes to um, and use it to actually um, remove myself as a bottleneck. And that goes basically to, to the next definition of what is the role of a team leader. Um, and a lot of team leaders uh, don't, you know, when I, when I became a team leader and I've been in the industry for over 20 years and I got to be a team lead in multiple different companies and projects and, I, and I've got to be an architect and also a director and a lot of different things. And these days I'm a consultant because that's what, you know, at some point a lot of people become consultants. Um, and, and then I got to see a lot of other leaders in a lot of other companies doing a lot of different things. Um, and everyone defines their role as a leader differently. And, and when I started out, the way I defined my role as a leader uh, is to protect my team. And now, if I say protect my team, a lot of people might say, well, that actually sounds like a good cause. Like how many people here protect their teams on a daily basis, right? Pro just raise your hand if you, if you do that or just go like V or in the chat. Do you protect your team from outside interferences, stuff like that? Do you go to meetings where you know you don't want the team to go to the meetings, so you go to the meetings that the team hates. Do you, stuff like that, you know. Do, are you the only source where if people need to have answers, you're the only source because you're like a bubble, or you're like the Superman uh, uh, above the team, protecting the team. You're like the, like the Captain Marvel or something. And, and in that regard, that's how I started my team lead journey, is that um, that's what I did. And at some point, I really was very, very proud of myself. I got to say, I was really proud because, you know, here I was protecting the team and I felt like Superman, like catching bullets, you know, like I protected them from this. They would come to me and say, well, we have a problem with this and I'll go, okay. And then I would code that thing late at night and then give them the code. Then the, uh, early in the morning, like, here you go. You're welcome, you know. Um, and in that regard... I was successful in protecting the team, but I, if I looked at it today, I try to, I would look at it as a failure for me as the leader because the team was basically, the team that I left after a couple of years was basically the same team that I started with. What does that mean? It means that they had the same set of skills, the same set of uh, uh, lacking skills. They, they were just happy being exactly where they are but they didn't actually learn new skills while I was there. They didn't actually become better. And, and to me, the way I look at the role of, of a team leader today is that my role is to make myself unneeded. 
So if I'm an architect, it means that my role is to make myself as an architect unneeded. It really sounds kind of weird if you say it, and it sounds like clickbait in a way, right? Uh, what's your role in a, well, my role is to make myself unneeded. Ha ha, I'm so smart. Look at me. I said a really, really smart sentence. Um, but the truth is, is that if I look at all the places where I'm needed, a lot of those places are repetitive. A lot of those places are things that I already know how to solve and that people that don't know how to solve them come to me. And then when I solve them, basically I'm perpetuating a situation. I'm creating a situation that basically creates more and more dependencies on me. And if I'm an architect or if I'm a team lead, and I know that architecturally, the more dependencies you have on a single thing, uh, the more that thing becomes um, critical to the infrastructure. So what happens if everyone depends on me, on things that I already know how to do, that are trivial to me, but are difficult for everyone else? I'm basically creating a culture where people feel that they don't need to learn how those things work. They don't need to learn how the architecture is supposed to work. They don't need to learn how to review architecture. They don't need to learn how to make a decision about anything because I'm the one making those decisions. And so I'm basically re removing those people's abilities or incentive to learn those things. And so, so what? Maybe that's exactly what you should be doing, right? Maybe if we should all just keep making the decisions and then that's it. But if we do that, then we're basically removing all of the ability for ourselves uh, to do things that we want to do. So for example, um, if I'm a team lead and I never have time to code anymore because I'm too busy going to all the meetings and making all of the decisions and doing everything that only I can do, then I'm, first of all, I'm removing myself from any task that I used to like in the code space and I'm making myself unavailable to other things. I'm not able to learn new things as a team lead. As an architect, if I keep making those decisions, I'm not able to learn new techniques, new types of architecture. I'm not able to experiment with new things because I'm too busy doing code reviews for everyone or anything like that. So there's a risk for me as well. And the third type of risk is, not only do those people not learn, and I don't learn, the company itself becomes in a much higher risk because what happens if tomorrow I become sick for a week? and I'm not able to make those decisions, right? What happens if the one person that knows how the build works is not available and nobody knows how to run the build? And I was actually in a situation very close to that where, um, you know, I, I consult for a company in Scandinavia a while ago. <clears throat> and in that company, there was a, yeah, there was a huge insurance product. And, uh, and in that company, there was one outside consultant that knew how to build work. And that person worked there for like seven or eight years. And all the build was in their head. So every release would take a week and that person would be in charge. And everyone was perfectly okay with that person doing the release, right? And then one day he decided, hey, I want to learn new things. So they wanted to quit their job and move to a new thing. And then basically the entire floor was shut down for three months because they couldn't do a release without that person. So what did they do? First of all, they lost a lot of money because they couldn't do a release. They had to bring that person as an outside consultant and pay them three times what the, that person was, was worth. Um, and then put like a camera on their screen and a microphone on their head and basically have that person do a release recording everything and explaining everything, trying to do some knowledge sharing. Right? So imagine the risk to the company if they're not able to ship bug fixes or anything like that. That's, that's a huge risk. And, and I call that risk the bus factor. If, if you've heard of the bus factor, is how many people have to get hit by a bus for the company or for the team to stop working. So a bus factor of one is the worst bus factor. Now, when I was working in Scandinavia, we called it the ski factor, right? How many people uh, have a ski injury and they're not able to come to work? but it's the same thing. It's the same problem. So if I'm a team leader, if I'm an architect, by definition, I'm a bottleneck. And by definition, I'm a risk. It's really important to understand. By definition, when I come to the job, I'm already a risk to the company and to the team. Uh, and the more I protect the team, the higher the risk becomes because if I'm not available, then basically the machine stops. And 
add to that the fact that I, at some point, will not be able to learn anything and the people under me are not going to be able to learn anything in that regard. So there's, it's not a learning organization. It's not, couldn't be an agile organization because we don't have enough knowledge sharing. So there's a lot of risks involved. So that's the way I view my role today. No matter what type of leader I am, whether appointed or not appointed, my role is to grow the team around me to solve their problems without me. So if I'm an architect, then my, you know, my vision is to create a team of architects. Now, what does it mean a team of architects? It means a team that can mostly do their jobs without me and whatever they need me for, I'm going to use it as a learning opportunity so they can learn how to solve that specific problem next time without me. Have you ever seen a team of team leaders? If anyone here has ever seen a team of team leaders, then you know what a self-organizing team is because that's a team that will basically, they can you know, rule the universe in their own little universe. They can just do whatever they need to do, right? Whatever they need to do, they know how to solve problems. They know, they've been through these types of problems and, and they know what to do when they're stuck. They know what permissions they need and they can basically go ahead. So if you, if you, if you took a, a team of, of a, a bunch of leaders from your organization and you put them as a team together, you would get a team of people that are not afraid of solving their own problems. And the most important part is that they know what to do when they don't know what to do. It's really weird. So let me just explain a team of leaders or a team of architects or basically what leaders are usually good at that other people are depending on them is what do you do when you're not sure what is the next best step? You know what to do to find out what is the next best step. So that's an example of a skill. Um, so if you had a team of team leaders, you would have a team that even if they're stuck, they can find a way to unstuck themselves. They don't have to go outside to get themselves unstuck. Um, so that's also what we can define as a self-organizing team. And in, in the agile development world, you know, you've heard the term self-organizing team. Um, so what is that definition? A definition is a team that can solve its own problems. And by definition, if you're a bottleneck, then the team cannot solve their own problems without you, at least for some of those problems. So if I want a self-organizing agile team, then I want to remove the bottlenecks and I will start with myself. Now, the scariest part is, what do you do if people don't need you? Do you actually still have a job if people don't need you as an architect or as a leader? And the answer is, you know, unsurprisingly, the answer is yes. Because if I had a leader or an architect in my organization that magically when you put that person into, into a team, that team grows and then you put that person into another team, that team grows, you know, they're like fertilizer in a way, right? They make the, the flowers bloom and the fields grow. That person becomes more and more uh, valuable to the organization. That's a really powerful thing. That person is worth more because they have a scale of change that is much higher. Because when I teach people how to do my job and then I leave for another team, the team that I left behind is now a team that knows how to, that has an extra skill. When they go on other projects, they can teach other people as well, right? So those other projects can also grow as well. So I've made a difference, not just for myself, I've made a difference that is in, in, in a factor, in a much higher factor than just working alone. And that's a much more effective thing. So I talked about the three reasons, let me just move myself here. So I talked about the three reasons we want to remove the bus factor. For, for our company. Uh, we want more time to learn and do the things that we want to do. And we want to make the team more effective because they have more skills. And of course, you might hear this and say, well, that's great, Roy, but in my team specifically, I can't do that. Like, I mean, maybe in the next team, I'm going to have some better people, but in the team I have right now, I don't know what, I'm going to challenge people to do my job and make them, you know, make those decisions and yeah, because I have a couple of people in my team. I, you know, I don't really, I don't think they're up for it. I don't think they're, maybe next time I'll try it. And I think that is, um, that is unfortunate, okay? Because you will never have the perfect team. You will never have the perfect team to grow, to say, well, that's the team that I can just let go. No, that's basically part of the job as a leader is to challenge yourself to grow the team. And that means that, 
You're going to have to work with people that have a variable experience. And that's part of your skill set that you need to develop, that I need to develop as a leader. Great teams are always grown. You can't hire a great team. You can hire a bunch of people, but to grow a great team, you have to take those people and teach them different skills that they need because they have different skills together. And that's, to me, the job of a leader is to grow the team uh, to not need them. And in that regard, that is to learn about the different skill sets and to basically challenge each person individually uh, to learn a specific thing. Now, again, if I'm an architect, it will be about architecture, right? If I'm, a, if I'm an ops person, it will be about ops. If I'm a security person, it will be about security. If I'm a team leader, it will be about things that team leaders do. For example, uh, making decisions maybe or maybe doing code reviews or, um, or anything or maybe even joining specific special meetings that only team leaders are allowed to join. Uh, I'm not talking about HR, but I'm really talking about um, delegating and teaching people skills that today they might not even know how to approach. How do you talk to people outside the team? How do you talk to marketing? How do you talk to, I don't know, technical support? Every company is very, very different. Um, so there's a book by Gerald Weinberg, which is, you know, uh, uh, he's a great author and uh, he wrote a bunch of books. He passed away uh, a few years ago, unfortunately, but he had a book called uh, Managing Teams Congruently. So I had to Google what congruently means and it means basically in flow where everything is kind of fits correct uh, nicely. Um, but it's a really good book and I really liked it when I was kind of growing myself as a leader. And he says, and I'm paraphrasing, leadership done right is a tough job, okay? If you're doing it right, it's difficult. That's why leaders get paid more. But then he says, a lot of leaders like to take the money and not do all the difficult parts. And that's where we are today, I think, in the tech world. So what are the difficult parts that he talks about? Does anyone... Um, Anyone want to kind of chime in and say or type, what do you think uh, Jerry Weinberg meant when he said, not do all the hard parts in leadership? What's the hard part? I mean, we said what the role is, what's difficult about it. Walking the talk, okay. What, 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 what does that mean? What, becoming a, an example? Okay. What else? Resolving conflicts, facilitating the well, facilitating resolving conflicts, how to remove the bottleneck. Well, that's difficult, but telling unpleasant truth to people, the human side. Yes, you're all absolutely right, and that's what I want to focus on. The toughest part, at least to me, and what I think he meant of leading teams is people. Technically, if I could get rid of people in the teams, everything would be so much easier. But leading people, that's the difficult part. And a lot of us, we come from the coding side or from the tech side of the job. We're really comfortable working with machines. We're less comfortable working with people and doing things that are not the comfortable parts. What's an uncomfortable? For example, having an uncomfortable conversation with someone, right? Or giving feedback or challenging someone to do something that they don't like or asking people to do something that you know that they might not like you because of it. Some of us have been part of the team before we became a team lead, and now we have to tell our friends what to do. And that's a very difficult thing. That's a human thing, and, and it's rightfully very, very scary. And I remember when I became a team lead, that was exactly my situation, and that's the tough part. Now, does that mean that we should uh, be like, uh, oh, just wear a tie and start telling people what to do? No. It means that we should start being more of a, um, learning more about people skills, learning more about ha having tough conversations. But specifically, what it means is that we should stop avoiding those things, right? The first thing that we should do as leaders is to realize that we have things that we have been avoiding up until now. And it was very comfortable avoiding those, those things. If I'm an architect, it's very easy uh, to just solve people's problems and avoiding teaching them, maybe because I hate teaching people, maybe because I don't feel comfortable teaching people, maybe that's a skill that I don't have, maybe um, I don't feel comfortable telling people to let's solve it together, etc. 
if I'm a team leader asking people to do something like joining a meeting that they don't like or doing a task that they think it's not their job uh, or, or trying something in a different way when they feel that the, the, another way is better, that's a difficult conversation to have. And that's part, that's part of what's difficult. So leadership done right is a tough job is how we should think about it. So if I'm a leader today, if I'm an architect today, if I'm anything where I'm a bottleneck today, and my job is sweet, like everything is perfectly comfortable, everything is easy, there's, everything is just perfect, there's nothing, there's no controversies, there's no conflicts, there's, there's, there's no annoyance, there's no you know, um, uh, frustration, then maybe I'm missing something. Maybe that's what I want to try and change. Maybe that's my part of my barometer of how I check whether I'm kind of progressing in the right direction. And I started realizing this. I realized that, yeah, maybe that's part of what's supposed to happen is, is that as I'm leading people, some, there should be something that's uncomfortable. There should be something that's frustrating sometimes and, and things change. Something should be dynamically changing. Um, so, in that regard, what does that mean in real life? How do we grow the team? Well, if we look at growth, we realize that growth is something that we, that we learn ourselves. Let me just uh, move, that, move that here. Um, so, you know what, maybe I'll do this here. Sorry about that, let's see. Um, so in another book by Jerry Weinberg, he, he had a book called Becoming a Technical Leader. And in that book, he talked about um, his learning process when he was learning how to play with a pinball machine. You know what a pinball machine is? You have these two things and then they go like this and the ball goes up and down and then you lose points and he hits it and goes ding, 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 that stuff. And he progressed, he measured his progression over time, you know. Um, I don't have a good pointer here, so I'm going to use my face as a pointer, Okay. This is the experiment. So he measured himself over time, okay? As, as he going over time, he said, okay, over time, how good do I get in the game of pinball? And as he was measuring it, he saw, well, obviously there's a linear progression here and things are looking better and better. But as, as he was, uh, you know, closely looking and, and plotting in a higher resolution, he could tell that there are, like you said, these... Uh, these um, kind of plateaus and then a, a quick uh, rise in, in terms of skill. So he had these places where he was slowly learning and then there were places where he was becoming much better, much faster. And he started questioning why that happens. And one of the things he realized is that um, he got much better quicker uh, when he was learning a new paradigm basically how to play the game. So when he learned that if you could play with more than one ball in the game at the same time, you get double points for every hit. When he learned to play this way, he became much better. He got many more points, right? Um, as he plotted things uh, in an even higher resolution, he saw that there's this, you know, this kind of um, plateau, um, ravine that goes down before he went up. And if we're thinking about it, if we're learning a new skill, that kind of actually makes sense because those ravines are us learning those new skills. So if I'm a developer and I'm learning a new programming language, then basically uh, I'm going to be much slower in the new language for a while because I'm much faster in the old language. When I, I started in Visual Basic, okay, when I learned uh, C Sharp, it took me a long time to learn C Sharp when I started in Visual Basic. And when I learned C++ or Java or anything like that, it's always much more difficult to write the hello world in the new language. So that's where the ravine is. That's where we are right here, okay? So before he became better, he actually became worse. That's the time of frustration. And I was, when I was looking at this graph, the first thing that I realized is that this reminds me of my own life, okay? Because I have three kids. And I was like, oh, three ravines. I have three kids. And I, that kind of feels familiar to me because if, I, if, I, if, I, if I'm looking at learning new skills, this is my wife and me here with no kids, right? We're all kind of 
living life, always complaining we never have enough time. And then our first kid was born and we are here. And immediately life became much more complicated. And we had to learn a bunch of new skills of how to raise a baby, how to sleep when you have a new baby, how to not, how, how to basically manage your life. And we were so tired, it was so difficult. And so that took a few good months just to get used to the idea. And we were here after that. So when between point number one and point number two, we were different people, right? Because we had many more skills. And when we looked back at the first point, we couldn't even realize how we ever said that we didn't have enough time because now we're doing everything we did before, but with, with a child. And that was nice for a couple of years. And then our second child was born. And here we are again. And life is even more difficult with two kids than it is with one child. Everyone who has two kids know this. Because one child suddenly seems easy. But two kids, now you actually have to go from one-on-one guard to one-on-two. You can't just have one person stay with two kids. It's really, really scary at the beginning. How do you go shopping? How do you sleep? They wake each other up. There's like chain reactions going on. A bunch of new skills that we have to learn as parents. But, you know, after a while, you learn how to deal with it. And suddenly, you know, if you look back, having only one child, so easy right? No kids, don't even talk to me. Now, these days we have three kids. So if you tell me you have, you know, two kids, I'm like, oh, two kids is so easy. Three kids, three kids. Now that's difficult, right? We had to learn a bunch of skills to manage life with three kids. In fact, you know, at some point when you have three kids, you you start teaching them how to take care of their brothers as I have three boys. So when you have the first child and that child kind of, you know, they have a, they have a, they're bleeding or something because they hurt their toe, you're like, oh my God, right? The second child is like, ah, I have no problem, just you know, lick it off. And, and then the third, when you have three kids, you just ask the, the, the biggest brother just to, to, to take care of the smallest one. So you basically have a self-organizing team right there. And that's what we mean by, by teaching people those different skills. Now, if we can say that these new skills, these skills that learning is always going to be difficult. Those ravines, they're part of learning. You cannot get away from them. No matter what skill you're gonna learn, it's always going to be difficult. We can take this knowledge and say, well, instead of this just happening to me, I can plan it. I can basically decide that I want to teach my team these different skills and I can push them into those ravines. So I can decide that if a person uh, needs to learn a specific skill, I'm going to challenge them to learn something that they don't know, which means I'm going to assume that they're going to be frustrated, you know, and it's going to be difficult for them for a while. And that's part of the the way it's supposed to work. And so I'm not afraid of having people a bit frustrated or annoyed as part of being on my team. That's actually what I expect from them to do. I actually plan that for them. And we expect them to learn those skills. And we also explain what's going to happen. Uh, if you have multiple teams at the same time, you teach the leaders how to lead the teams, right? That's kind of the idea. By the way, this is the actual plot. It's really, really difficult. <laughs> I mean, actually, it's really not difficult to see that there are ravines and there are fake ravines. There are things that are not difficult. They just take a while. Okay, so for example, learning a new framework is not a ravine. It's not a challenge. It's not learning a new skill, right? Right? It does slow you down a bit, but it's not, it's not scary. It's not frustrating. Learning a new skill is doing something that scares you a little bit, something that feels a bit out of place. Um, trying a new language, joining a new team, doing something that you've never done before, basically. Um, that's what ravines really feel like. So to grow the team, we've first realized that we can do this ourselves. We cannot expect people to jump into those ravines if we haven't jumped into that ravine ourselves. Because if I'm going to have a one-on-one with one of my teammates, I'm going to say, well, I want you to jump into this ravine. And I've never done this myself. They're going to know. They're going to know and they're going to say, well, that, that's bullshit. What do you, why should I listen to you? So it has to come from a place where we've actually tried it ourselves. Where we've actually, you know, we're able to, to do something that scared us and know and come up on the other side to succeed. And I would say that your ravine as a leader is to grow your team, is to have those difficult first conversations about challenging people to learn uh, new skills. If I'm asking people to learn a new skill, that's a scary conversation to have. Um, uh, Let's see. 
Um, the next thing I want to talk about is, you know, we don't have a lot of time <laughs> either for the presentation and also in our work life. A lot of people, when you say, well, what, what do you want to, I'm, I'm okay with challenging people, but we're too busy fixing fires right now. And the concept of time is really important because I don't expect you to now go ahead and teach your team everything if you're too busy fixing fires. So how do you actually make time? And this is where the concept of elastic leadership comes in. Because elastic leadership is basically uh, looking at the way that we're working in these different phases. And I would say most teams here today are in like survival mode. Survival mode is where we don't actually have time to learn new skills. We are all too busy fixing fires. And learning mode is basically where we're trying to challenge people. A lot of agile coaches and all that stuff, they talk about, hey, you should challenge your team and, you know, the scrum master should not have any whatever, et cetera, and everyone should make the decision. But if your team is in survival mode, it will never work because they don't have time to do practice those skills and try those new things. So you have to get out of survival mode to be able to actually go into learning mode. And the learning mode is what brings us into the self-organizing mode. So there's, if that's, we want to be here, but a lot of us are here. To get from here, we actually have to be here, learning mode, okay? Um, so I'll just cover um, a quick a guide map. What do we do in this case? And, and I'm happy to answer more questions and that's kind of where the book is, right? But in survival mode, well, we, can, we can define if we're in it, if we don't actually have time to learn new skills. And our goal is to move to learning mode. And we can set like 30 days re-estimation deadline because a lot of times we're in survival mode here because we are overcommitted. So we have to remove some comments. We have to re-estimate some commitments. And after that, we have to build the learning time into our estimates. What does that mean? It means that we can re-estimate some things for the next three months that either we, we take a third of the scope or a fifth of the scope or re-estimate whatever we need to do based on Kanban method, but we can add um, three to five to even 10 times more for the first few items to learn necessary skills. I, if I want to teach my team about test-driven development, then I can't expect them to learn about it when they're already too busy um, fixing fires. It's not gonna happen. And I think that's one of the reasons when I was teaching people about unit testing, that they kept staying in the same spot is because they were in survival mode and you can't expect the person to change their behavior if they're here. We want people to be here. And that's, you know, that's a, there's a whole conversation we can do that's a whole different hour about those three different things. I just wanna leave you uh, a thought, the, the team leader manifesto. Um, so uh, we believe great teams are grown, not hired. The goal of, our, of the leader is to continuously grow the skills of the team. You know, we must continuously pursue challenging ourselves and our teams to become better right here instead of keeping everyone in their comfort zone. Uh, we exceed just in time adaptive leadership style. That's something that we haven't discussed yet, but between those different stages here, if we go back, sorry. Uh, the type of leadership style here, I don't know if you can see here, right here. Uh, this is more of a facilitator. And you're definitely much more of a dictator if you're in the survival mode to get out of survival mode. You're definitely much more of a coach here. So the leadership type also matches the phase we're in. You can't grow people, but, you, but when the ship is sinking, you can't tilt tell people what, uh, you know, what do you expect to do? You can just tell them what to do. When the ship is sinking, you know, the captain gives orders. They don't call a meeting. Um, so uh, just a final couple of things. Uh, and lastly, participating in human interaction at least as much as we do with machines. That's kind of the uh, manifesto. If you want to uh, learn more things, um, you can, you can uh, kind of uh, contact me here. This is my email. This is my Twitter. Find me on Twitter. We can, tag, we can talk. And I'll also stay on the Slack channel if anyone wants to continue the conversation. This is the book. Um, that's basically it. I uh, hope everyone uh, found it useful. Uh, may the force be with you. And uh, thank you very much, everybody.